Hello and welcome to episode 65 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live streaming career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, we talk about the music of The Jam and The Style Council as I'm joined by record producer, recording engineer, arranger and lecturer Peter Wilson. We'll dive into his time at Polydor from 1975 through to working with Paul Weller on demos, producing The Jam's final studio LP, The Gift, and several singles, including Town Called Malice. He continued to work with Paul in the first few years of The Style Council, producing and arranging huge songs that you know and love. So there's going to be plenty for us to discover in this episode. Let's get into it. Peter Wilson, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. This one's going to be really interesting, Pete, because not only were you there with the jam at the height of their success when they were getting number one singles, but you were there as well with the transition as Paul split that band up and started the Style Council. You were there right the way through that transition as well. It was painful for a lot of people. You know, a lot of mostly males <laughs> felt let down because their guitar hero had gone all, or gone soft. That was one perception of it, wasn't it? Yeah. To, I mean, just to, but to go to talk about the jam then, as you know, I only came in towards the end of their career as, as engineer and producer, but I was working for Polydor when they were signed. And I can tell you a bit about the background at Polydor, right, what was going on. I joined Polydor in 75 as a, as a staff engineer at their studio in main offices, which was in Stratford Place, just off Oxford Street. I mean, they were busy with things like Saturday Night Fever and all kinds of other stuff, the Bee Gees. And, but in 77, or maybe end of 76, punk started happening in London, the 100 Club and so on. What was interesting was the A&R department started to sniff at this sort of thing, you know, because it was tiny. It was pretty tiny, but it was record companies really want to sign up the next big thing and sign it up early Mm. because it's cheaper. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So um, in particular, Chris Parry, the A&R man, was was checking out bands. They were chasing the Sex Pistols before they signed, and I remember they were booked in to do some demo sessions at the studio, but that didn't happen because they'd already gone off with another company. The Clash came in, did some demos, which I recorded, three or four days of of demo recordings for Polydor, but then they went off to CBS. Uh, Susie and the Banshees were signed to Polydor. The Jam became signed to Polydor, of course, for a famously small amount of money. And they were the only ones, of course, that went on. Well, I suppose The Clash had a, a great career. The Sex Pistols had a short career. The Jam had a long, relatively long career, didn't they? And Paul Weller's still active, although I don't know who else is. I mean, who do you say jo- Johnny Rotten's active? So when was it you first started working with the jam? Come into the studio to do demos of their songs or just maybe to d- rehearse a bit. Or Paul would come in on his own with, with a, some songs to knock them down and just see how they sounded and to demo them and so the rest of the band could hear them. I was on quite a few of those sessions. So, And this would have been more particularly uh, sort of in the middle of his of that career, setting sums and uh, uh, sound effects sort of time. Oh, brilliant. And was that that was him and Dave Little, his guitar roadie, his guitar tech at the time. Was that right? Dave and Paul, yes, largely. I mean, one of the demos that came out of that was uh, That's Entertainment. There was an album out called Extras, wasn't there? Which had B-sides and outtakes and demos it's funny how you look back at stuff isn't it because i think now the story is that that only took paul 15 minutes to write that song but is that the reality in in your experience in your world when we did the demo as i recall it was pretty well formed he'd written all the lyrics i think and he just you know played it with an acoustic guitar and put another guitar on top and put a bass on it i think on the demo can't remember exactly what's on it you can you can hear it on the album and um there were some other things and if if he'd run out of songs We'd done all the demos he happened to have, you know, all the songs he happened to have. We'd, he'd have, you know, maybe a spare afternoon or day in the studio. We'd muck about, you know, we'd knock down some Kinks covers or Beatles covers. You know, we did uh, Annual Bird Can Sing off Revolver and we did uh, that Beatles B-side called Rain. I think we did Stand By Me, didn't we? Things like that. I think they did a Sandy Shaw number. <laughs> but I can't remember which Kinks songs we did. I played on some of those, um, like the drums on Rain. And I put an organ on and your bird can sing. So it was it was low pressure fun, you know. 
And then when they wanted to split with their then producer after sound effects, they asked me to do a couple of singles, which which were Funeral Pyre and Absolute Beginners. And then they asked me to do the, the album, which turned out to be the last album, of course, The Gift, which um, included Town Called Malice, which was a big hit. But, I mean, it was a bit awesome, really, you know, because they were huge then. You know, they'd, they'd done Going Underground. They'd done Down in the Tube Station at Midnight. They'd done Start. You know, they had an absolutely fanatical following. They were on top of the pops and doing big stuff. You know, they were big time. So even though I'd produced some records and got them in, you know, that had gone top 10, it was still a challenge, you know, an exciting challenge. You know? yeah. So I took them to Air Studios, which was then in um, Oxford Circus. It's, it's moved. It moved after that up to Hampstead. But but it was George Martin's place. Um, great studio and uh, nicely placed for Soho, you know, in the West End. And, um, yeah, we recorded, did most of our recording there. The thing I find really interesting as well, when you talk about The Gifts, that last jam album, there's definitely a different sound on that album from that kind of traditional, the jam sound that we knew, I suppose. And live, I think they were still playing at a million miles an hour from where I work, work out. But you've got a different sound. You've even got credits on the album for people with Steve Nichol on trumpet and Keith Thomas on sax. And um, if we talk about The Bitterest Pill, songs like that, you arrange strings on that. So the jam, and, and particularly Paul, I'm guessing, really pushing it in different directions. Would that be fair? I think it was Paul. I can't say it was me. It, my job was to listen to what the band wanted to do or the songwriter wanted to do and uh, support that, you know, constructively and um, take it in the direction that, that, that it was going, you know, unless it was a bad direction and it wasn't, you know. But uh, I have to say during that album, it was stressful. I think because of the record company circus, I call, I call it, of the round and roundabout of, of, you know, you make an album and singles, you release it, you tour it to promote it, then the record company wants another album and you've got to go right, come up with 12 new songs and then the whole thing starts again. And it's, um, and they'd done it for what? How many years? Four or five years. And it's, it's grueling. You know, I mean, I think the Beatles found this, didn't they? Something similar, you know, their career, their touring career was very short as the Beatles. So, um, and there was just, there was tension and difficulty and there was a lot of pressure on Paul to come up with the songs, you know. I mean, as I recall, there was a, the record company wanted the album out by Christmas, whichever Christmas it was, I can't remember, uh, which is a great marketing idea because if you're a high-end artist, if you're a big seller, if you're major league, what will Joe Public go out and buy for his dad or his mum for Christmas? CDs and vinyl, you know. So it's a huge market and and you want your product to be out there. Well, it didn't happen, you know. Yeah, it's really interesting. I was looking earlier on at the big jam box set, um, Direction, Reaction, Creation. And in there, there's not only all the albums, the B-sides, the demos or whatever, but there's, there's this book that has in it all the dates for the jam live. And it's really interesting when you look at like, even 82, I think there were like four tours. And we're talking six albums in six years. It's mad. So you time get squeezed between tours and you're supposed to be producing, you know, good quality stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's high pressure, you know. Anyway, so uh, that was the last album. And I think yeah. Paul was feeling that then. The other thing that really stands out, we should mention, I mean, there literally is no end to your talents, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> you're actually playing on this stuff as well. So a couple of tracks on The Gift, you're, you're playing on there. Only on The Gift, I think. I thought it was Trans Global Express as well. Is that right? Uh, maybe. To be honest, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> if I did, there. did I do some keyboard or something? I might have done yeah. that. And, and am I right in thinking that you're classically trained? So as a, as a young kid, this is what you, you learn, yeah? I suppose so. I mean, I did piano lessons and I did a music degree, so I'm bit posh like that <laughs> Which is, it's, I mean that's I, I mean I still have a great love for classical music and stuff like that you know and so working with Paul if we talk about we'll talk about the transition to the style council in a second but working on that album did it feel like it was coming to an end as far as the jam was concerned just some fr- frictions and which you, which you get in any band I suppose but I suppose it with in retrospect it became I mean Paul had the whip hand you know he, he was a songwriter so if he called it, if he said, this is it, this is the end, there's nothing others could do about it except try and persuade him, but it didn't work, you know. I think he'd made his mind up by the end of the album. Do you remember where you were or how you found out about the split? Because you then oh. were heavily the style council from day one. So were you aware of it early on? Was Paul having conversations? I didn't know about it before the band members were told. Okay. I mean, and that would have been, no, that wouldn't have been a nice thing, you know. Fortunately, left out of that sort of conversation. And it was just a, a, you know, a fait accompli by the time I knew about it, which was fine. So Polydor wanted Paul solo after that. 
that was that was what was in their heads, I think. And yes, I don't know if they, I, I don't know if contractually they had him by the small and curlies or or whether it was, I don't know the ins and outs. Yeah, and I think, I think, I think yeah. Dennis, was, Dennis Mundell I chatted to was even saying, I think the contract was actually with Weller and it was then his decision to kind of work with Mick and the Style Council. And, which is oh, I see. Cool. Well, yes. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that makes complete sense. Paul could hire and fire as he, as he wished, you know. Which kind of then you see how then that kind of honorary councillors, of which you are an honorary councillor. I don't know if you know this. You're on the list of honorary councillors. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not not in honorary. every list of honorary councillors. I mean, I... I did more than some of them, but I'm not going to beef about it. I was got I got a, I got a credit, you know, and a royalty. Yeah. So thank you very much. Were you involved from day one? From speak like yes. a child, literally. Yeah, like yes, yes. Uh, speak like a child. Well, I just remember the sessions with Zeke Manika. Yeah, Zeke's name? been on the podcast. Zeke was lovely. Yeah. Oh right, I'll have to check that out. Uh, he was great uh, playing drums. Um, so in a two or three days, whatever it was, we did uh, Speak Like a Child. There must be a demo of that somewhere. And we did um, a kind of jam. They did a sort of jam that became Money Go Round after extensive editing by me, extensive editing by me, because, you know, like, oh, there's a verse, that'll do, and there's a chorus, that'll do, but it's got to come again after the second verse, so I'll copy that over there. And so this is all razor blade. I was going to say this is all tape. magnetic tape. Yeah. You know, this is not digital editing. This is tape on the floor and you know sticky tape and stuff. Yeah. You know, it's- yeah. yeah, wow. So I, when I started my radio career, it was it was that time. It was all everything was on tape. It was just just around this is the early nineties, a transition into digital. And you, you forget. I mean, how complicated that was. You do. <laughs> You'd have bits of the neck, the, the chalk where you had to make the mark and little razor blades. Yes, <laughs> that must have taken. Trying to keep track of the bits of tape. You know, which bits which. Yeah. writing on the back of it with China Graph and things like that. Anyway, that, it wasn't usually that complicated, but that one was once we got the, the multi-track, two-inch multi-track all laid out, it, it became much easier, you know. Yeah, Speak Like a Child. Um, I was really enthusiastic about that early on. You know, I, th- I heard the demo, we did the demo, and I thought this was a good song, and, it, and it, I think it came out really well. And I think it's fair. I mean, that song doesn't sound a million miles away from something maybe the jam could have done, but maybe you, you do see a point of where it's going. And I think it really does show a difference when we get to the A Paris EP, which is a magical piece of work. Did you did you get to go to France? Did you get to go to Paris? May we? Certainly. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Um, John Weller said to me, I've got a studio in Paris. Uh, booked can you go and check it out so i got on the plane went to paris there was some polydor guy the other end who was very kind to me and took it took the day off to take me around and the studio was crap you know it was some demo studio and i thought this is no good this is we can't record here what else is there so he took me to this nice studio called studio de la grande armée it's down near um ends of the champs elysees up past the arc de triomphe so nice, nice location, good studio, and they were available. So we we went back there for I think it was only a week. Was your recce just you on your own at that point in the band? Me on my own, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we did um, Long Hot Summer backing track. We did Paris Match with a fabulous accordionist. Parisian accordionist <laughs> who played, you know, in 10 minutes, he just knocked off a great track. Then there's some lovely singing by a, a woman uh, in French, the the match that started my fire, the match that started my fire, l'allumette qui something mon fear or whatever it is. She did it in harmony. She was actually American, but she lived in Paris and she was a session musician. Oh, yeah. So that was booked. It's lovely when somebody else books a session musician you know, it's not up to us to find them. And they turn out to be great. And that, that was how it was. And then we took, uh, I can't remember, did we do any other songs there? I can't remember what other songs we might have done there. Took the text back to London and finished them off and mixed them. And it was really interesting because Mick picked the um, a Parry EP as his favourite. Uh, yeah. Um, and the reason for it was because there were four tracks on it and each one, yeah. he said, showed you a different direction that the Style Council would go in. Really productive period for Paul and the band. They, I mean, they before we even get to Café Bleu, the amount of material that they're working through together and coming up with and then those those singles those fabulous singles aren't even on that first album you're churning the stuff aren't you i was going to say something about that um i think paul and maybe the rest of the jam had always had this attitude that singles shouldn't be on the albums i think that the that the justification for that view was that normally a record company would put out a single you know for radio play then maybe it would climb the charts and the band would do top of the pops and then they put out the album and the, the public rush out and buy the album. The argument against that, given, is that 
all the fans will buy the single. And then the album comes out and they're all going to go and buy the album. But they've got that track already. So they're paying twice for something and it's ripping off the fans. Have you ever heard that argument? <laughs> I've heard it. I don't understand it. It sounds... <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. As a, a backup to that argument is the, is, the, uh, is the suggestion that, well, the Beatles never did it. You know, you've got um, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. That wasn't on the album. So... It's just adding to the workload. <laughs> that's how I saw it. The bit that's strange, though, is because the story of the jam is this pressure cooker and having to produce so much more material all the time. And then he's kind yeah. of making life even more difficult for himself by adding, adding more material than he's, than he's really been asked for, isn't it? It was certainly more relaxed, I think. Um, it seemed more relaxed in the Star Council's vibe, you know, more relaxed than the end, the, the end of the jam that I saw. Were you in the fashion club of the Star Council? In the sense that you were looking for the white Levi's jeans everywhere they went, were you keeping up? No, no, <laughs> no, I wasn't. No, um, no, I kept out of that really. <laughs> a wise, yeah. a wise move. Um, <laughs> um, tell us about the first couple of albums. So, Cafe Blur, first album is. I mean, it's remarkable. It's bonkers. It's a real rag bag. Is that unfair? Um, it's a real diverse range of styles. Yes. You might say some are more successful than others. One that I don't think was so successful was, um, if I can cite that, what's that jazz one? Miss Ship Came In. I thought we were listening to a lot of Blue Note, and so was Mick, you know. Yeah. Blue Note yeah. Records, the jazz stuff, you know, Herbie Hancock and those people, Wayne Shorter and uh, Cannonball Adderley, I suppose, and, um, you know, wanted to emulate that, you know. It's hard to do that. But there, was a, there was a real mixture of stuff there, wasn't there? There was even that rap, you know, um, uh, yeah, it got a gospel, wasn't it? The start yeah, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a, a chance for Paul to sort of let his hair down, really, so to speak, you know, and, and try things out. Hmm. And maybe uh, our favourite shop was more firmed up, you know, the direction, although that's still quite diverse. Yeah, very much. So. Yeah, it's got Lenny Henry doing a vocal on it for a start. Yeah. Well, the thing that I also find really fascinating is that um, Paul would also re-record and um, and re-release songs. So even like my ever-changing moves, there's like a slow version, fast version, full band, just the two of them. That must have been really interesting to be a part of from a production point of view. Of kind of seeing these these new treatments of those songs. That was it, and was that a discussion between the two of you, or is that something that he kind of went? No, it's not well? generally. He just said, "I'd like to do it. I've got an idea." You know. The My Ever Changing Moods, did it start as a piano and, so and vocal? I think it did. And then, mm. and then he had this idea of doing a, an up-tempo one, which came together so quickly in the studio. It just kind of fell together, really, you know. And I grabbed a, a bass synthesizer and played a bass line to it. And there it was, you know, mostly just got put the horns on and a bit more bongo and <laughs> redo the vocals, you know. And, and <laughs> it, it was happening. It was great. What was it about the four of them that, that became... Yeah, obviously Dee and Steve were honorary counsellors initially, but then it kind of becomes this nucleus of a band, the four of them, really quickly. What was it about the four of them that, that worked in a studio environment and, and worked in that band? I don't know. It did work, yes. I mean, uh, I mean, Mick had the, the, the keyboard chops and he was you know, a fantastic collaborator. Steve was... It reminds me of Tony Williams. Do you know when uh, Tony Williams, the jazz drummer, first played with Miles Davis, he was 16. You know, yeah. he was doing gigs with this legend, you know, and Herbie Hancock was only about 19 or 20. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was quite an awesome lineup, actually, they, the Star Council when they went out full strength, you know, three or four horns and uh, two percussionists and Helen Turner on keyboards as well as Mick and um, it, not always D, sometimes uh, someone else. Yeah, great band. So when you talk about the live performances, you get to see them much live. Some. We, yeah. They yeah. were abroad a lot. Uh, I think we did. I went over to Amsterdam, I think. They, they were doing a TV show, were they? Okay. But they, they, they were big in Japan, actually. Yeah. There's a rather poorly shot video from Japan. The lighting is crap. So dingy. Oh, dear. The sound was fine. You know, I mixed the sound, but the visuals, I mean, oh, dear. What a shame, you know. Maybe it's changed now. You know, I think camera technology is much better, and you can catch a, a good picture with much less light because they were talking about, what, the end of the 80s or something, you know, quite a long yeah. time ago, technically, yeah. quite a long time ago. I mean, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was the live recordings because Polydor captured a lot of stuff for both the jam 
and so the early stuff from the from the Star Council of those of those yeah. live gigs to the point that we've had a few live albums. Um, obviously, there was the one straight after the band split and um, Dig the New Breed, um, and then more recently, I say more recently, it's probably still another twenty years ago now. To think about it, but yeah. the Live Jam and where yeah. you remix some of the songs and stuff. So, um, yes, how did you? I mean, it must have taken an awful long time to go through all those archives of gigs and listen to things and pick the best ones. How do you do the job? It did take a long time, but you know, it's worth it. There were loads of recordings. I mean, there was a very good gig from Reading which was I don't know if it was ever used there was the 100 Club from the very early days in the city I went up to a couple of recordings in Scotland which were great events to be be at uh, uh, Glasgow Apollo and Edinburgh Playhouse the crowd were amazing they were as loud as the band (laughs) Uh, you know absolutely you know and then Kids in the street, you know, besieging the, the stage door and the management had wisely chosen a hotel an awful long way from, <laughs> from Glasgow. <laughs> yeah. So in the coach and, you know, drive for half an hour. That was great. I mean, and the recordings were great. We had a rough list of songs, went through all the versions, right? There might be three or four recordings of each song and some were non-starters. So that was easy. And then there might be two that are good. I mean, excellent. And it had to be a choice made. Um, I have to be honest, I'm not always a fan of the live album because I think there's something very special about being in at a gig, at a live experience. And you can't always capture that on record. But I think one thing you have done with the Jam and the Style Council, when you put those on, those live LPs, it really does feel like you're taken there, doesn't it? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be like, you know, and yeah. it's hard to get that sometimes. So if you've got an audience that you're gagging for it, it helps a lot. And a good recording, yeah, and a great band, yes. Talking about our favourite shop, what was this, 1985? It feels like the sound's progressing, they're moving forward. A lot of people talk about that as their favourite Style Council album and them being right at the top of their game. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, because it was the last one I did. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, it's a great album, and, yeah, I, I'm not so attached to the, uh, to the later ones. I'm not an impartial observer, so I can't give a, um, an impartial answer, really. And what do you remember about recording the album? So we've got great songs like Homebreakers, Come to Milton Keynes, Internationalist, A Man of Great Promise. There's, there's some killer songs on it, aren't there? Yeah, and I think they all work pretty much, all work really well, even though they're diverse. And, and uh, John Meeling has to have a credit for, he did a great arrangement for Come to Mil- Milton Keynes, which I think really works wonderfully. You know, it's sort of fantastical. I mean, I know people in Milton Keynes gave Paul a bit of flack for that. You know, they thought mm. it was unfairly dissing their, their town, but... It was kind of, uh, uh, it was like a kind of, I think, representative in, in Paul's mind of, of some kind of uh, alienating environment where dreams are sold to the occupants. You know, the orchestration enhances that with the harp and the, I don't know, it's just really clever, I think. Mm. And he also did a great job on the Stone's Throw Away, the string quartet arrangement, which I thought was a lovely idea, you know. I think that was Paul getting inspired by Eleanor Rigby, you know, the McCartney song, and um, and it works and it's great fiddle, great string playing. Yeah. We recorded that in a studio in um, Marble Arch. I don't know if it's still there. It was called Pi Studios, and down in the basement, and underneath that is the central line. If you're recording a rock band, it's fine, but if you're recording a string quartet, you could definitely hear <laughs> every four minutes, you know, a tube train going past, you know, this sort of low-frequency rumble. So we had to get around that, but we, we did. But, uh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I always think with the Style Council, it's these beautiful pop songs. The sound of them is so lovely. But a lot, and, and the Milton Keynes track, you know, some really kind of scathing lyrics in there half the time, but hidden within this beautiful pop, like jolly pop song. I know, I know. That's um, that's part of the um, the genius of it, isn't it? And the stones throw away about the um, miners, you know, mm. in a very quite a sweet song, bittersweet song. You mentioned our favourite shop being the last time that you worked with the Style Council, and um, actually, lots of that period had co-production credits for you and Paul as he moved forward, and, and he was producing stuff himself. Do you feel that I don't know? Was was there bits where he would, had learned an awful lot from you? taking that on or was he always somebody that contributed in that space yeah, he wouldn't say i mean i was learning from him you know uh, i mean <laughs> but he did tend to follow his heart and follow his nose and to have somebody a bit more dispassionate if you like just to keep track of everything else it was useful you know i did relish the opportunity to arrange for strings or arrange for horns or whatever or play the occasional instrument um so it was collaborative and that was that was a lot of fun, you know. Did you ever get to play live with them? No. They asked me to play keyboard on the last jam tour. I'd already arranged my wedding date. <laughs> so that fucked it. <laughs> 
That would have been a lot of fun, wouldn't it? Oh God, yeah. Can you can you imagine? My God, absolutely. And what about Paul Weller since then? So the solo years, we've had what thirty years of Paul Weller solo now. What have you made of that? Have you have you followed that too? Not to such a great extent. I mean, uh, uh, it's of interest, but I don't buy every album to be honest. Some of it's so good. I mean, I watched that Barbican concert. It was really good. Some of the songs were... I mean, he did some of the old songs. He did a real mixture. I suppose he did his best songs, which is fine. You know, that's, that's a good idea, you know. But they were great, and he, he was in very good voice. I've heard him in worse voice maybe 10 years ago. He, sometimes he was quite ragged, it seemed. Maybe at, at live gigs if he was just pushing himself too hard. But um, no, he was in good voice, and he... You know, it was, it was great. It was excellent. Yeah. One other thing I really wanted to touch on before you go is um, the work that you've done outside of the Style Council, the Jam, the Blow Monkey, Shane McGowan, Sham 69, etc. Um, was lecturing and being a professor of music technology and giving back for quite a long period of time, lecturing in that world, in that space. What did you find so rewarding about that kind of work? Just working with young people and hopefully they're excited about it, you know, and trying to encourage that and um, help along with skill acquisition, you know, musically and technically. And it's really, I mean, it's such a world away from the industry that you entered back in 1975 now, isn't it? The music industry. And I can't imagine starting off now. It must be so hard. Yes. And and uh, recording studios, that, that sort of scenario is changed so much declined you know the big recording studios they're just many of them are closed most of them are closed i suppose partly because you can buy all the kit yourself it's not the same doing it in your garage but um or your bedroom but uh a lot of corners are cut and then of course the revenue stream has disappeared all that all selling albums and cds for 10 quid virtually doesn't happen anymore you know so so as they say the only way to make money is doing gigs you know, you can't rely on Spotify or, or iTunes. You might get an income from telly sales. You know, I mean, um, if your track gets used in a film or on a, on a TV, yeah. you, the songwriter, right, yeah. will get some income. You, the drummer, will get virtually nothing, you know. So being in a band, making records is not viable and, and, and it doesn't rec- doesn't support the, the recording studios. No. And would that be the same in production? For a producer, that would be the same thing, I'm guessing. Yes, very hard to sell records or to make an income. And, and, and the record producer's income comes from, would have come from royalties. You see adverts all the time for, um, I do, I just come across them wherever it is, for young men who've been on a degree course, maybe, you know, University of Westminster or Leeds Leeds College of Music or something like that. They've bought the gear. They've got a room. They're advertising as producer, 200 quid a day <laughs> for, the, for the studio and his expertise or her expertise, you know, hoping for bands to come in and spend their own money. Well, it's a hard sell. And I did have mixed feelings about – because I was teaching people pre-degree mostly, the idea of trying to sell the idea of doing a degree, a degree course in music production, music technology, you know, because there's jobs out there. Well, I had very mixed feelings about encouraging people to go into the business, you know, because to make a living is extremely hard, you know. Back in the day, you know, in the 60s, 70s, when there were recording studios like Air Studios, uh, well, there still is, but a lot of studios like Air Studios, you know, with a whole uh, a whole phalanx of, of engineers and tape operators and so on and maintenance engineers, it was busy, busy, busy. You know, there'd be uh, recording jingles in the morning, you know, two-hour session to record a jingle, 10 till 12, 1 o'clock, 1 till 5, somebody would come in and record a single. And then a rock band had come in at 6 and stay till two o'clock in the morning. You know, three <laughs> different sessions in a recording studio. It's a factory. Now, if you want to record, make a jingle, you don't get hire an expensive recording studio. You do it at home with Pro Tools or with Cubase or with Nuendo. You know, you uh, and if you want strings, you get out your sampler, and maybe, and then you get some talent in they call it talent you know to do the voiceover or to sing then you've got a room you know you only need a small room inside yeah. of a bedroom you know with i mean okay if you're successful you might have your own a proper facility with aircon you know and a receptionist these big studios they're kind of dinosaurs generally i mean there's a few left that do film music you know so air studios or angel studios in upper street or cts out in wembley i think they're still going and that's about it you know they're or Abbey Road. They were talking about closing it, weren't they, about three three years ago? 
been saved. <laughs> uh, it's a historic institution, you know, the Beatles studio, Studio 2, so-called. I did some blow market stuff there. It's big, uh, and, and it's like a third the size of Studio 1, which is massive, you know, so you can get your 80-piece orchestra in there and do film music and classical stuff. Expensive to run, but, you know, you only need one or two of those in London. That's really interesting because there's been lots of talk on this podcast about the importance of Black Barn as his HQ, as his, his studio, own studio now, um, and how important that's been to his music over the past you know, decade, maybe a couple of decades. I feel like maybe Solid Bond was a similar thing for you and the Star Council. Was that, would that be right? Yes, it was because uh, it was management offices as well. You know, that's where John and co used. And it wasn't really used as a commercial studio. I mean, they had a stab at it, but it was very little used by others. So it was kind of a little bit of an expensive thing to have if you're not using it all the time. But the fact that it was available all the time was great. But uh, I think the lease came up and uh, it's prime site, you know, it's right on Marble Arch, you know. It must have been quite a whack for on, on rates and mm-hmm. so on, ground rent or whatever. Yeah. So Black Barn out in Surrey is must be much more cost efficient. Pete, this has been so brilliant to spend time with you and chat about all this stuff. I've loved every second of it. I've got just a couple of questions left. Um, I have to ask you what you're up to now. Well, I'm retired from most things. I've done a bit of uh, mixing for... Um, for a great Latin salsa band called Orquesta Mambarito. And we've done uh, four tracks, I think. People have been recording in their homes, sending me the audio and uh, sending to the mastermind, Dave Strahan, the video of them recording. And uh, so it's been put into videos. I mean, it's... It's a, more of a fun project than a money earner, really. It's up on YouTube. It's great fun and great band. I love it. We'll have to, I'll have to dig that out and put it in the show notes for the podcast. And final question, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the jam, the style council or solo. What are you going to go with? It might be Long Hot Summer, actually, or You're the Best Thing. Or a town called Malice. To be fair, Pete, three fabulous selections there. Long Hot Summer's a really interesting one, actually, because I think when you think of the Style Council, obviously they existed in the 80s, but to me they don't sound like an 80s band, and and I mean that in a good way. I think a lot of it's down to that production as well. It still sounds really fresh. It sounds so different. Obviously, I, I think they were using real instruments really helps, but actually Long Hot Summer, when you look at it, using a drum machine, wasn't it? Yeah, my Oberheim DMX machine. But it, it, if you just put a bit of bongos and shakers and things on, it transforms it a bit. But yes, I, no, I was when I hear on Radio Two and some some of the stuff from the eighties, brass drum machines. It's that sort of kind of thin metallic sound to, to everything, which we didn't get on our favourite shop, did we? Oh no, absolutely, that's so true. Pete, this has been so nice to spend time with you. Thank you so much once again for joining us on the Paul Weller Fan Podcast. I really appreciate it. Nice to talk to you and uh, keep the flame burning. Well, there you go. What a joy. Peter Wilson, my very special guest on the latest episode. Thanks to Pete once again. You can find more details about this episode in the show notes for this podcast. And please do share on social media. It really does help us to find listeners listeners to the show get in touch on twitter at weller fan pod or on instagram and facebook it's paul weller fan podcast and don't forget check out the show notes you can even buy me a coffee as well i'll see you next time